Hello, fellow teachers. Welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to welcome you to our second part of the book of Jeremiah. And if you're new to the channel, I want you to know that my goal with these videos is to help you to either teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy, with more impact, uh, with more power. I know that as a teacher, sometimes you just need an idea, uh, something to teach, and a way to teach it. And I hope that I can provide teachers with that resource. And then you can take these ideas and make them your own and apply them to your own student situations. But I really hope that uh, these videos are blessing you and helping you to either teach or study on a, on a deeper level in the scriptures. And, and with that, let's go ahead and grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. And our icebreaker for the week is a, a little pre-quiz. Let's see how well you know your current church statistics. From the most recent statistical report from the church, given in General Conference of April 2022, where do we stand right now as far as numbers go? And you could do this activity together as a class uh, with, uh, with slides, or you could do it as a handout, which I'll make available as a download this week. And here are the questions. How many missionaries did we have serving in the world in 2021? 23,724, 38,963, 54,539, or 78,446? The answer is C, 54,539. How many missions are there currently in the world? 123, 257, 392, or 407? The answer, D, 407 missions. How many converts joined the church in 2021? 25,902, 94,897, 168,283, or 298,543? The answer is C, 168,283. What is the current membership of the church in 2021? 16,805,400, 28,531,475, 35,098,902, or 57,237,698. And the answer for this one is A, 16,805,400. So almost 17 million. And finally, and this includes numbers from our most recent general conference in October of 2022, when all of the temples that have either been announced or that are under construction have been completed and dedicated, how many temples will the church have in total around the globe? A, 186. B, 234, C, 267, or D, 300? And the astonishing answer to that one is D, 300 temples. Now, now aren't those statistics staggering to you? We live in an incredible time. I mean, 300 temples. When I served my mission, there were less than 50 on the earth. And now I'm 46, and in that short of an amount of time, the number has more than quadrupled. There are five times as many temples now. I can't even keep track of all the temples in Utah, my home state. I don't think I could name them all. Well, the prophet Jeremiah had something to say about the latter days. His prophecies, made more than 2,000 years ago, are being fulfilled right now before our very eyes. And he's going to say something about our days that I find fascinating. All throughout the Old Testament, 
when the Lord's people spoke about the power and nature of their God, Jehovah, when they wished to point to an example of his sovereignty, his supremacy, what event did they always point to? What miracle overshadowed every other one up to that time? That miracle was the Exodus. They worshipped the God of the Exodus, the God that was able to free them from Egypt, direct them through the wilderness, part the Red Sea, and lead them to a promised land. No other miracle since that time, in their minds, compared to that miraculous display of their God's strength. But what interesting thing does Jeremiah say about this in chapter 16, verses 14 through 15? Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, and from all the lands whither he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. So did you understand that? What incredible thing did Jeremiah just prophesy? He says that in the future, there will be an even greater, more impressive event that will eclipse the magnitude and grandeur of the Exodus. And what is that event in verse 15? The gathering of Israel, the restoration of God's people to their promised land. That will be even more impressive. That's going to be so amazing that people aren't going to go around saying, the Lord liveth that brought up the children out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord of the gathering liveth. Now, what's Jeremiah referring to there? Has that promise been fulfilled? And if so, how? Over the years, I've encountered a number of different interpretations of this prophecy. Four, to be exact. So, so what gathering is Jeremiah specifically referring to here? Some may say that it's talking about the ancient return of the Jews to the city of Jerusalem. That fulfillment is actually going to happen within a lifetime of this prophecy, just 70 years. In 70 years, Jews will be allowed to return back to the city of Jerusalem to reestablish themselves. Think Ezra and Nehemiah. And we could point to Jeremiah 29 verse 10 for a specific example of that interpretation. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. But another possible fulfillment of that prophecy is the long-term promise of the Lord that the Jews would return to their homeland and reclaim Jerusalem as their capital in the latter days. Has that happened yet? Yes, the Jewish state of Israel was created in 1948. The events that led to and that surround the establishment and preservation of the modern state of Israel is a topic too extensive and vast to cover here. But I'll tell you, if you study the history of that country and the subsequent wars that have been fought to preserve it, it's very hard not to see in that a modern-day miracle. The book, O Jerusalem, or the movie Exodus, can give you a bit of a good idea of how that all took place. And then you have the continued miracle of how that nation has endured and prospered even in the midst of enemies on all sides. Another possible fulfillment of that prophecy, though, is of the latter-day gathering of Israel. That's going to be the most significant one to us as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's missionary work. We know that we consider ourselves to be the modern-day house of Israel. 
Could Jeremiah have been contemplating the missionary efforts of the restored church of Jesus Christ when he's saying this? And then another possible interpretation of the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecies would be a more personal interpretation. Could we apply this promise directly to ourselves? Is there personal relevance in the promise of a gathering back to Christ after being scattered from him through maybe our own poor decisions? So which is it? What's the correct interpretation? My answer? All of them. (laughs) They're all correct. That's how these prophecies work. I believe that Jeremiah had each and every one of these in mind when he made them. Remember that these ancient prophets speak with parallelism. They speak of their own time, Jesus' time, our time, all at the same time. So whenever we encounter gathering prophecies, let's keep each of these possible fulfillments in mind. Now, I'm not going to comment any more on those first two fulfillments because I think our time would be better spent on the two that are most relevant to us, the latter-day gathering of Israel, and the personal application of being gathered to Christ ourselves. In that light, Jeremiah is saying that the things we witness now in the modern-day restored church are greater than the miracles of the Exodus. Do you believe that? Are the things we witness now greater than the parting of Red Seas and bread falling from heaven and pillars of fire leading the way? Now let's, let's think about that for a little bit. And as far as the Latter-day Gathering of Israel is concerned, or the missionary work that we're engaged in, the next verse, Jeremiah 16.16, 16, teaches us something. Jeremiah says that the Lord is going to send out two different groups of people. What are they? Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. So what are the two types? You've got fishers and hunters. Now, what do you think is the difference between the two in relation to doing missionary work? Well, do we have any fishermen out there? And if so, when you go fishing, typically, how many fish do you catch? (laughs) Now, I, I would be a terrible one to ask this question because even when the fishing's good, I still hardly ever catch anything. I mean, seriously, put me at a fish farm, bait my hook with the with the most irresistible lure on the market, allow the fish to starve for a couple of days, and I still won't catch anything. But you expert fishermen out there, how many do you typically catch? I'm willing to bet that you probably catch quite a few. 10, 20, maybe more if the fishing's really good. And if you consider the type of fisherman that Jeremiah is referring to here. He's probably talking about commercial fishermen, not just hobbyists who do it for fun. When commercial fishing boats go out to fish in the ocean, how many fish do they typically pull in? A lot. Hundreds, thousands even. They pull them in in large nets, in droves. And so, okay, now do we have any hunters out there? Typically, how many animals does a hunter bring back with them? One, usually? Maybe two? A very small number. I know of hunters who will go out and spend long hours or even days waiting behind a blind or up in a tree or hiking a certain area for the chance to bring back just one animal in an entire year. With that in mind, since it's the gathering of Israel we're talking about here, what do you think these two types of missionaries could represent? Who are these fishers and hunters? Well, my thought is that there are fisher missions out there, 
and there are hunter missions. Fisher missions are those places where the church finds lots of success. Places where missionaries will teach and baptize many, many people. The nets are cast out and numerous souls are enclosed in them. So, like England, Denmark, Scandinavia were fisher missions in the early days of the church. But I would say there are probably more hunter missions now. Central and South America have long been a source of many conversions in the church. And now Africa seems to be fulfilling that role. And the church is growing very rapidly in that part of the world. These are fisher missions, fisher areas. And the Lord needs those fisher missionaries to go out there and fish them and do that great work. But then he also needs hunters. Hunter missions are those areas in the world where successful conversion stories are few and far between. There may be some missionaries who go out and spend an entire mission working and teaching and inviting, and in the end, maybe only see one or two converted. That phrase where it describes them hunting in every mountain and hill or hole suggests great effort in seeking out these individuals. So perhaps some of the European or Asian missions could fall into that category. These are hunter missions. And the Lord needs those hunters to accomplish his great work. And the point then is that God needs both. I feel that I served in a fisher mission. Brazil, where I had the chance to teach a lot of people, and I had the privilege of seeing a number of them enter the waters of baptism. My sister, on the other hand, served in Taiwan, what I would consider to be a hunter mission. And her experience with teaching the gospel was very different from mine. She didn't do the same amount of teaching or, or see the number of conversions that I was able to witness. So did I do a greater work than my sister? No, no. The point is, is that neither kind of missionary's labor is more important than the other. I was no more of a successful missionary than she was. It's just different kinds of work. The missionary that brings in many is not more important than the one that brings in few. Although some may be tempted to feel that way. To defend that position, I would quote Doctrine and Covenants section 18. In verse 10, Remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Every soul is of great, great worth. And then verse 15, And if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be, one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father. How much is one soul worth? An entire lifetime's worth of labor. Even if you bring just one soul to Christ, after working your entire life for it, it's going to be worth it. How great will be your joy with them. Jeremiah gives us another image of the gathering in chapter 23, verses 3 through 8. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. As God's sheep, he's provided us with not only the good shepherd, but many shepherds. Our prophets and apostles, our general authorities and our local leaders have all been set up for us. And they feed us, help us not to be afraid or dismayed or to lack anything. One of the greatest blessings we have in the latter days is this structure of support 
and leadership. We've got so many shepherds out there to help assure our spiritual nourishment and our safety. Primary and Sunday school teachers, bishops, stake leaders, seminary and institute teachers. Each age group and gender has an entire organization just dedicated to assuring their spiritual development. Planning activities, putting lessons together, printing materials and manuals, preparing inspiring messages and talks. I hope that we don't take that for granted. It's part of the miracle of the Latter-day Church. We are fortunate to have this entire community of support just handed to us. And so Jeremiah reiterates the point that he made back in chapter 16. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. We are experiencing that miraculous deliverance and return of the glorious kingdom of the house of Israel right now. And we're all a part of it. And it is a phenomenal time to be a member of Christ's church. So the truth, in the latter days, God will gather Israel from among all nations and peoples. This will be the greatest work and greatest miracle the world has ever known. Truly, it's a marvelous work and a wonder. So to liken the scriptures, what about the latter-day gathering of Israel most excites or impresses you? What about it is miraculous? And that's a really fun question to ask your classes. I know it's easy sometimes to focus on all the challenges the church and its members face right now. The opposition, the criticism, the temptation that surrounds us the challenges to faith that our children have to deal with. But what are the positives? What remarkable things can we point to as evidence of God's favor and miraculous power being manifest in the church right now? Just think about it. Is it the fact that it's 18 to 20-year-old young men and women that are the backbone of carrying the missionary work forward? Just imagine what most 18 to 20-year-olds are are doing at that time in their life? Is it how the church has established itself in almost every country around the world? Is it the numbers and rapid pace of the growth of the church since its restoration in 1830, now boasting millions of members worldwide? Is it the fact that we have 15 prophets leading and guiding us? I mean, can you think of any better example of leadership it's comparable to what we have. I definitely don't see it in government or business or education. We have the best and most genuinely sincere leaders at our head. Is it all the scriptures that we have? There's so much that we get to study. I know you know how much I love the Bible, but what if that was all we had? That's the reality for our other Christian brothers and sisters out there. But not only do we get the Bible, but the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price. It takes us four entire years to get through a cycle of teaching the standard works. There's that much to study. It's an outpouring of God's word and wisdom. Or is it the incredible temple building effort that we're engaged in right now? 300 temples. If you were to see a map of all the temples that are around the world, I think it'd be impossible not to be impressed and excited. Or just think about the prophet's announcement in our most recent general conference. I'm so happy for all those wonderful members of the church down in Mexico City. Can you imagine how that announcement must have been for them? Not just one temple, but four at once. How cool was that? And soon we're going to have a temple in the middle of the Middle East. I never imagined that was even possible 
in my lifetime. So whatever it is that stands out to you the most, it is certainly a miraculous time to be a member of Jesus' flock. No other time period in earth's history is comparable to our day. Just like Jeremiah prophesied, the miracles of the gathering are even greater than the miracles of the Exodus. If you've ever looked back at those people of the Bible with longing or envy of the amazing things that they got to see, pillars of fire, seas parting, bread from heaven, remember these prophecies. We are privileged to see even more amazing miracles than that. More exciting than the Exodus. I imagine that if we were to meet some of the children of Israel in the spirit world who actually experienced the Exodus, we may be tempted to say, wow, you were part of that? You lucky, you got to see such remarkable things. What was it like to see the Red Sea part or the pillar of fire that led you? I wouldn't be surprised if they looked back at us and said, are you kidding? You lived in the latter days? You experienced the gathering of Israel? Oh, my friend, no. I am envious of you. You saw greater miracles than I ever did. Moving on. I like to do the following illustration with my students to introduce this next message of Jeremiah's. I like to help my students understand how worldly hope differs from godly hope. And we use that word all the time. And I worry that we may begin to confuse how those two types of hope work. They're completely different. There are things that people hope for in this life. A student might say, I hope I pass this test. A young couple might say, I hope we have a child soon. Someone that's unemployed might say, I hope I get the job. I hope, I hope, I hope. We use the word hope all the time. And I worry that we start to get the sense that it's the same kind of thing when it comes to having hope in Christ or hope for a better world. And so I like to set up this little scenario for my students. Now, if you do this, you're going to have to put a dollar on the line for it. But chances are that you'll still have that dollar by the end of the lesson. I invite a student to come up and I tell them that I'm going to give them a chance to win a dollar. And then I show them the following slide. And I say that they have one chance to spin the wheel. And if it lands on the dollar space, then they get to keep it. And I ask them if they hope they'll get the dollar. To which they respond that they do. And I allow them to use my laptop or a mouse and invite them to click on the needle of the wheel. And that gets it spinning. And then when they choose, they push the needle again and the wheel stops. Now, chances are it's going to land on a no money space. And I say, oh, I'm so sorry. We don't always get what we hope for, do we? Now, if it does land on the dollar space, then I give them the dollar and I say, hey, sometimes we get lucky and we do get what we hope for. But let's try it again with somebody else. And I can almost guarantee that it's not going to happen two times in a row. And I explain, well, that's kind of how life works with hope, doesn't it? It's the luck of the draw. Sometimes we get what we hope for, but then again, a lot of the time, we don't. It just depends. That is how worldly hope works. But let's look at another kind of hope. When it comes to God's love, Christ's mercy, blessings from obedience, the promise of a better world at Christ's second coming, people of faith claim that they have hope in these things. Does hope in these things work in the same way? Well, let's have another volunteer come to the front and spin our godly hope wheel. Let's say you're a person that hopes God will forgive you if you repent. Spin the wheel. Or let's say you hope for a glorious resurrection. Spin this wheel. Or, or let's say you hope that God loves you. You could spin this wheel. And you can see that no matter when you click the needle, 
it's always going to land on a hope space. That's how hope in God works. It's a guarantee. It's hope in something certain. We can rest calm in the assurance of God's mercy, the promise of a glorious resurrection, or the triumph of Zion over Babylon in the end. Just knowing and trusting in those things can help us to keep moving forward even when things get hard. We can, as Nephi said it, press forward having a perfect brightness of hope. Well, Jeremiah shared a message of hope with his people. And that message of hope came at a time when you would think that it was the last thing God would give them. We studied the nature of these people uh, in Jeremiah's time last week. They were terrible. They were wicked. They were faithless. They persecuted the prophet. They refused to listen to his pleas. But in the midst of all of Jeremiah's warnings and rebukes, even these people were given a message of hope for the future. And that message was also intended for us. Because the Lord knew that we would also be studying Jeremiah's words one day. They weren't just written for the benefit of his people, but for us too. It's a message that's relevant for anyone who may be tempted to feel hopeless. Do you? Do you find it difficult to have hope in God's grace or mercy? Either for yourself or for someone that you love that's strayed. Do you find it difficult to have hope in seeing your loved ones again after they've passed away? Do you find it difficult to have hope in a better world in the future? Do you find it difficult to have hope in Christ's victory over death and sin? Jeremiah may have something to say that could help. So that's the big question. How can the following set of verses give us hope? We're going to approach this part of the lesson through a personal relevance lens. The people of Jeremiah's day are long gone. So we want to look at these verses from a latter-day perspective. And I'd like to give you a case study. I want you to imagine that you're talking to a friend who's feeling hopeless for a number of reasons. For one, they've done something in their past that they're not proud of. And, and they, they just can't seem to leave it behind. They've repented, but they just don't feel good about it still. Also, they have a beloved family member who's lost their faith completely. And now they're really worried about that person's future. They're also very discouraged just by everything that they see in the world around them. All they hear is bad news, and the world just seems like a, like a bleak, dark place. How could you use the message of these verses to help this person? What would you say? Now, as a teacher, if you wish to cover more material in less time, you could count out your students from ones to fours and assign them one of these sections of scriptures to study, and then call on students to share what they would use from the scriptures to help give this person hope, or have them share what they found in groups of four. But let's take a look at each of these messages ourselves. Jeremiah 8, 19 through 22. Before we look at this one, an observation. There are a number of different metaphors in the scriptures used to help us understand the nature of sin and repentance. In some places in the scriptures, sin is filthiness, and we need to be washed clean. In other places, sin is bondage, and we need a liberator. In yet others, sin is debt, and we need a mediator. In other places, sin is the breaking of a law, and we need an advocate to plead for us, which is the one that I think we emphasize the most. But there's another metaphor that we find in the scriptures, and that is that sin is sickness or a wound to our souls, and we need a doctor, a physician, and medicine so that we can get better. Of all those metaphors, I know which one I prefer, that last one. It gives us a very different way of viewing the sinner. They aren't necessarily the criminal that needs to be pled for, but they're sick and they need a doctor. Or more personally speaking, if I'm doing something wrong or I'm struggling with a temptation, 
rather than feeling like this terrible lawbreaker, I can instead see myself as unwell, as someone who needs help. And if I'm just willing to go to the doctor and seek his care, then he can heal me if I'm willing to follow his prescription. And that's the approach that Jeremiah appears to be taking in chapter 8, verses 19 through 22. Behold the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black, which according to the footnote isn't a skin color comment, but an idiom meaning gloomy. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? What Jeremiah is saying here is that Judah is sick. They cry out. They claim that they're not saved, that it's too late for them, that the harvest is over. They're hurt, gloomy, astonished. But then the Lord asks them some rhetorical questions. Is there not balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? The implied answer here is, well, of course there is. And why don't you realize this, my people? Healing and help are available. They always have been. Gilead was a city that was east of the Jordan River, an area more fertile and green than than other parts of ancient Israel. And in Old Testament times, there was a special balm or healing ointment that was made from the plants of the area that people would use to heal cuts and wounds. So Jeremiah draws on this healing imagery to ask why his people are still suffering and hurt. Why they seem to have no hope for recovery. He assures them they're not terminally ill. There's medicine available. There's a physician waiting to nurse them back to health. How could you use these verses to help the person in our case study? You could tell them that there is always help and healing available in Christ. Go to the physician, he has the medicine. The balm that can heal all wounds. We can always find hope in him and his power to heal. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. What would I use from these verses? Realize that the Lord has thoughts of peace for you and not evil. You don't need to go around feeling like God is mad at you or ready to give up on you. If you search for him with all your heart, you will find him. And he can bring you back to that place of peace. He will gather us all back to him. Jeremiah 31, verses 12 through 20 and 34. And in my mind, Chapter 31 is the major message of hope from the book of Jeremiah. And the entire chapter is just brimming with it. But we'll take a closer look, particularly at verses 12 through 20. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat and for wine and for oil, and for the young of the flock and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy, 
and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. God can do this for us too. He has the power to take our sorrows and our mourning and turn them into joy and comfort. And I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children, because they were not. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. There's no need to cry or lament if Christ is on your side. Once we turn to the Lord, we can refrain our voice from weeping and our eyes from tears. There's hope in thine end. Verse 18, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. So now, Ephraim, or the northern kingdom, or the lost ten tribes, are being personified here. That's who Ephraim is. And he says, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised. As a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke, turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. So Ephraim pleads to have the yoke put back on him, the wonderful yoke of God's commandments and guidance. I'm tired of being rebellious. Please put your yoke on me. Turn me and I'll turn. I'm ready to follow. I'm ready to go to work for you, Lord. And so 19, surely after that, I was turned. I repented. And after that, I was instructed. I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. So Ephraim repents, but he still feels unworthy and ashamed of what he did in the past. The Lord's message to him? Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. So Ephraim, I haven't forgotten you. I promise that I will surely have mercy. Now, the interesting thing about this part is that Ephraim is long gone by Jeremiah's day. The Assyrian conquest of northern Israel had taken place in 722, over a hundred years before. And yet the Lord is saying that he's not forgotten them. He does still earnestly remember them. His bowels are still troubled for him, and he promises to still have mercy upon him. So God doesn't forget his children. How could that message help our person? We could assure them that it doesn't matter how far removed someone may seem from God and faith. God still earnestly remembers them. His bowels are still troubled for them. His hand is still outstretched to them. Hopefully, ours are too. Never give up hope for those you love that have strayed. You never know what might change someone's heart in the future. I know of people who have strayed from the path for decades, and then something happens, or something just clicks inside them. They remember that past warmth and light of Christ's gospel, and they want to return. I've seen that happen many times in my life, my own grandpa being a perfect illustration of that principle. And then from that same chapter, a promise that we've seen before, verse 34, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And I know I've shared this example with you before, but this is another place in the scriptures that we can highlight this most hopeful of principles. The fact that God forgives and forgets. 
And it's a little imaginary scenario that my fathers used to, to help people really internalize this principle. Imagine the judgment. Now, I don't imagine the judgment like a courtroom, but more like a personal worthiness interview. Like the judgment you have with your bishop before you're issued a temple recommend. And in that scenario, it's just you and him in two comfortable chairs in the center of a, a large room facing each other. And in my imagination, Christ looks at me and he says, this is your judgment. I'd like to ask you some questions about your worthiness to enter my kingdom. Did you obey my commandments? And what would you say to that question? I know what I would say. I would hesitantly say, I tried. To which Jesus says, well, let's see. And then between us, a little screen pops up and starts to play scenes from my life. And what does he show me? All the times that I'd been obedient in my life. All the times I told the truth. The times that I reached out to serve. All the times I resisted temptation. And then the screen disappears. And he looks at me again and he says, Well, did you obey my commandments? And after seeing all that, I say, Yes. And he's just about to move on to the next question when I can't help but interrupt. And I say, But wait a second. You only showed me the good things. What about all my failures? What about all the times I didn't choose the right? All the times I didn't tell the truth or turn off the movie or help the person in need? You didn't show me any of those. And with that, he looks back and he says with great love, Oh, I don't remember that. I must have forgotten. And then he asks a second question. Did you preach my gospel? And again, I would say, I tried. To which he responds, let's see. And the screen pops up again and scenes begin to play. He shows me friends that I invited to church in my youth. Scenes from my two-year mission in Brazil. My efforts to share the gospel with my neighbors. And the visits I made as a home teacher or minister to try and reactivate less active families. And then the screen disappears. And he asks the question again. So, did you preach my gospel? And I say, yes, Lord. But what about my failures? What about all the times I didn't share the gospel? All the times I kept to myself on the airplane? All the times I could have made more effort to share and invite my neighbors? But I didn't. Again, he looks at me with great love and he says, Oh, I don't remember that. The questions, they just continue on and on like that. Did you redeem the dead? Were you a good father? Were you a loving husband? Did you serve faithfully in your church callings? And each time, my failures are forgotten. Do you feel the power in that verse and the miracle of that promise? Does it give you hope? This is one of my favorite principles of all the gospel. He forgives and forgets. And remember that that promise is spoken to a very rebellious and hard-hearted people. But he assures them that if they would just be willing to turn back, all their past problems and sins would be forgotten. All right, our final set of verses. And these come from the book of Lamentations. And I know I'm not spending much time covering this book, but let me just give you a brief synopsis of it. For the most part, it's a collection of acrostic poems written by Jeremiah, bewailing the fall of Jerusalem. And if you want to just get a good taste of what the book is basically like, read chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. That'll give you a good sense of the spirit of the rest of the book. In my opinion, chapter 3 is probably the best. It contains the message of hope. So in 3, 21 through 26, he says, 
This I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That's a beautiful thought, isn't it? God's mercies are new every morning. Every day you can wake up with a new sense of hope in God's mercy. If he seemed angry at you yesterday, just hang on. Hope comes in the morning. Every day he stretches out his arm to invite us to return to him. Every day he's there to help and comfort and reassure us. So continuing, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And later in that same chapter, For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. God doesn't enjoy punishing the wicked. He doesn't afflict people willingly. Think Moses chapter 7, where Enoch sees the weeping face of the Savior as he speaks about destroying the wicked in the flood. He doesn't do those kinds of things willingly. It's hard for him to see his children suffer. He's a compassionate God. Therefore, if anyone is willing to turn back to him at any point, he will surely receive them back with open arms. Can you see how that message might help our friend who's feeling hopeless? The truth then, hope in God is guaranteed hope. We don't have to wonder if he'll forgive us. We don't have to speculate on whether we'll be welcomed back by him. We don't have to question his love for us even after we've strayed. We don't have to wonder whether there will be peace and triumph over evil in the end. We can always rely on our godly hope. To liken the scriptures, what about God's nature or plan provides you with the most hope? Well, if there are any of you out there right now who are perhaps feeling in any way like the individual in our case study, then I ask you Jeremiah's questions. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And I'll answer that for you. Yes. Yes, there is. And I pray that we can echo Jeremiah's words whenever we're tempted to feel hopeless. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, will I hope in him. It is certain that we have so much to hope for. Now, if it hadn't been for this most recent general conference, October of 2022, I'm not sure if I would have selected this final message to focus on this week. I probably would have done Jeremiah 18 with you instead and, and looked at the clay in the potter's hands message. But the Come Follow Me manual has some good ideas on that, and there's lots of other sources that you could go to for help on that chapter. But there's an additional thought from one verse in Jeremiah 31 that I feel I could perhaps offer you some insight on. As an icebreaker to the idea, I might hand my students the following paper or display the following phrases. And as you know, one of the big announcements this general conference was that of a new for the Strength of Youth pamphlet. And the changes from the previous pamphlet are quite interesting. And I have to say that I'm very, very grateful for that pamphlet that I've had ever since I was a teenager. It gave me so much guidance and help. And so I was very curious to see what they were going to do to change it. So here's a comparison in the language of the previous pamphlet with the current one. And what do you notice? And here are some of the phrases I display. From the old manual, you should not date until you are at least 16 years old. When you begin dating, go with one or more additional couples. Avoid going on frequent dates with the same person. 
developing serious relationships too early in life can limit the number of other people you meet and can perhaps lead to immorality. Now compare that with the new one. In some cultures, youth get to know members of the opposite sex through wholesome group activities. For your emotional and spiritual development and safety, one-on-one activities should be postponed until you are mature. Age 16 is a good guideline. Counsel with your parents and leaders. Save exclusive relationships for when you are older. Spend time with those who help you keep your commitments to Jesus Christ. Another one. Immodest clothing is any clothing that is tight, sheer, or revealing in any other manner. Young women should avoid short shorts and short skirts. Shirts that do not cover the stomach and clothing that does not cover the shoulders or is low cut in the front or the back. Young men should also maintain modesty in their appearance. Do not disfigure yourself with tattoos or body piercings. Young women, if you desire to have your ears pierced, wear only one pair of earrings. And now from the new pamphlet. As you make decisions about your clothing, hairstyle, and appearance, ask yourself, am I honoring my body as a sacred gift from God? Heavenly Father wants us to see each other for who we really are. Not just physical bodies, but his beloved children with a divine destiny. Avoid styles that emphasize or draw inappropriate attention to your physical body instead of who you are as a child of God with an eternal future. The Lord's standard is for you to honor the sacredness of your body, even when that means being different from the world. Let this truth and the Spirit be your guide as you make decisions, especially decisions that have lasting effects on your body. Be wise and faithful, and seek counsel from your parents and leaders. And then I do have one more example there. But I think that gives you a a good idea of, of the differences between the two pamphlets. So just allow your students to consider that comparison for a while and let them share their thoughts. What do they feel is the significance of these changes? One thing I might discuss with them, is this an indication of God changing his standards? Is this a lowering of expectations? Did the earlier versions of the pamphlet get it wrong? And now the church is correcting itself. They were too strict or prescriptive in the past. Interestingly enough, one of my students came in the day after conference and said, so we can get tattoos now, right? Well, How would you answer that? Is that the message the leadership of the church is sending with this new pamphlet? Is the message, tattoos are church approved. Begin dating whenever and however you wish. Modesty is an issue of personal preference. The definition of what kind of media is appropriate or not is relative. Is that what we're communicating here? Personally, I don't think so. And Jeremiah says something that I feel can apply here to help us understand the significance of this development in church standards. How might Jeremiah 31, 33 apply to this situation? But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So what do you think? Where should the law be written? God's standards, his expectations. In our hearts, our inward parts. And if the law is written on my heart, then I don't need a giant rule book governing every aspect of my choices. I don't need specifics. I'll know instinctively how I should act and what I should do in any given situation. Because I understand who I am, what my purpose is, and what and who I represent and stand for. I go to my heart for the answer, and not necessarily the written page. So I don't think this is a matter of lowering the bar at all. On the contrary, I believe this represents a major raising of the bar or a sign of the increasing spiritual maturity of our youth. 
This is God encouraging us to allow the law to be written on our inward parts. And these updates place a far more significant amount of the responsibility for the choices that we make on our own shoulders. It's the difference between following a specific rule and following a principle. I think it's far easier to follow rules than it is to follow principles. I mean, wouldn't it be easier if the church just came out each month with a list of approved movies, music, and video games that they felt it was appropriate for members of the church to consume? I could just go to that list and say, all right, here's what's okay and what's not. I wouldn't have to do any amount of mental or spiritual legwork. If there were specific measurements by inches or millimeters of what constituted modest clothing, or if the church just produced our clothing for us, then our choices on how to dress would be much simpler. This is okay. This isn't. But what's happening here is God's saying, you have the Spirit, the Holy Ghost that one person has is the same Holy Ghost that another does. And you can all come to know what you should do in whatever choice that's placed before you if you appeal to that power, genuinely and sincerely and honestly. Consider what I've said in my scriptures. Consider your divine potential and worth. Seek to understand the principles behind righteous living and let that be your guide. Remember that one of Jesus' greatest criticisms of the scribes and Pharisees of his day was their overzealousness in following an incredibly detailed list of specific outward applications of the law of Moses while condemning everybody else who wasn't walking up to those specifics. However, their hearts weren't committed to God, only themselves and their own reputation and advancement. They were whited sepulchers on the outside, but on the inside they were full of dead men's bones. The law was not written on their hearts. I think the hope is that we internalize these principles of righteous living and act accordingly. And to be honest, I believe that if we really understand who we are and the kind of people we are meant to be, that we're to be different from the world, then the standards that we've lived in the past haven't really changed at all. Hopefully, they've just migrated from the written page to the fleshy tables of our hearts. Joseph Smith was once asked how he was able to manage and lead such a large and diverse group of people. His answer, which Elder Uchtdorf quoted in his talk, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. Principles provide us with the guidance that we need to make our own decisions using the gift of the Holy Ghost that we all received when we were baptized. As the new pamphlet says, the purpose of For the Strength of Youth is not to give you a yes or no about every possible choice you might face. Instead, the Lord is inviting you to live in a higher and holier way, His way. This guide will teach you about His way. It explains truths He has revealed. Make these truths your guide for making choices. I also believe another positive that comes from this update is the fact that very specific rules and applications of principles does make it easier for us to judge others who may not be living up to those specifics. There's less for us to condemn in others. If we grant people the benefit of of seeking the Spirit themselves and making their own decisions based on their relationship with the Holy Ghost, we more easily place the judgment for those choices on Christ's shoulders, where it belongs, rather than taking that role upon ourselves. If that person has erred in their judgment, or dismissed the promptings of the Spirit, or compromised with what they know to be true and right, that will be between them and Christ. We don't need to get involved will be far less tempted to wave that specific standard in their face. Instead, we can examine our own relationship with the Spirit. So the truth, if I allow God to write His law on my heart, I will know what to do and how to act without the rule book. And to liken the Scriptures, 
Do you feel that this new pamphlet will change the way you live the gospel? If so, how? Well, I'm very grateful for this indication of an increased amount of trust from God in our ability to rely on the teachings of Christ and the promptings of the Holy Ghost. I feel honored that he would place more of the responsibility for our choices on our own shoulders. I hope and pray that this will help all of us to live a higher and holier way, rather than be used as an excuse to lower standards. May God's law be ever written on our hearts. And if it is, may we always follow our hearts. And that's all I have to share with you this week, Uh, my friends. Thank you for spending this time with me this week. If you're a teacher and you'd like access uh, uh, to use some of the resources that I create for teachers, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find the links that will take you to those resources. If you enjoyed this, if if you found that it helped you in any way, I ask you to, to share it with somebody else that you feel it could help. If you haven't subscribed, do that. If you hit the like button or make a comment, that helps the message to be more easily found by other people. Thank you again so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.